are listening to the Christian Ghetto Podcast. Welcome to the Christian Ghetto Podcast. I am delighted today to have as my guest um, Oren McIntyre, who really needs no introduction. Um, I have him on today in part because I was listening to a recent interview he did with um, Benjamin Boyce. And um, in the middle of the interview, um, Ben threw out a comment about building community on the internet and social media. And Oren reacted, um, you know, quite strongly, just basically stopped the conversation in sort of midstream and said, I have to disagree with that. I don't think that you can build community at all over the internet. And um, that was surprising. Um, it, it was for its vehemence, but also because um, I happen to agree with him. So um, thank you for coming on to discuss this, Oren. And um, maybe I'll I'll let you kind of set it up. Um, why why is it that you don't think that uh, you can build community over the internet? Yeah, thanks for having me. And you know, it, when Ben and I were talking, uh, you know, to clarify, we obviously can work together on the internet. We're doing that right now. We're exchanging ideas. You know, we're building a, a certain level of rapport. You know, you and I have had several conversations over many hours, so we know each other on on a certain level. But Ben was talking about something different, not just like some some level of coordination or, you know, swapping notes, this kind of thing. He was talking about true community, you know, truly something that you can rely on, that you can count as a deep interpersonal, fulfilling, you know, understanding. And I wanted to make it clear that while I think that the Internet is a powerful tool and it can be used to build relationships, I mean, I have a job because of the Internet I have a number of the friends that I have now because of the internet. Um, and I have seen a number of the projects that people in, I guess you could call the, the dissident right sphere, uh, things that have become real world projects like the old glory club and others have come from online discussion and meetups and discord servers and these things. So I'm not saying that there's just nothing that can be done online. But there is, uh, I think, a problem when it comes to the idea that you can do things entirely online, that you can have the same relationship with someone online that you can have in real life. Because real community is about accountability and it's about uh, friction. You know, you, you build community, not just in the positive things you do together, but also in the ways that you hold each other accountable, the ways that you push back against each other. And a lot of that just doesn't happen when you're not in a room together. You know, one of the things that people try to do in Twitter is they try to have like intellectual conversations. And I always explain to them, you can't do that on Twitter because there's no way to pin someone down on what they're saying. They can just go a different way. They can completely ignore you if they feel like they don't like how the conversation is going. They can drop it and pick up something else. There's no there, there's not an immediate method of kind of reciprocation that you can have for good or bad behavior in the way that you can in a real life community. And these are just some of the basic things that you need to, you know, to share these experience, to, uh, to, to build a system that is not just saying some things that we agree with, but actually creating um, lasting bonds in real life. Again, I do have real life friends that have met on the internet, but it is the fact that we have broken bread together is the fact that we have shared in-person experiences together that I think pushes things across that line from kind of internet uh, acquaintance that you're friendly with to someone you can actually be in community with. And I think that it's dangerous to treat the internet uh, as, as if it can do something that it can't. Uh, and as long as you say, well, it's okay for all of these things to be entirely online and we can do the whole thing entirely online, uh, then you'll miss critical parts of what it means to really build a coalition, really build community. Well, yeah, and it. There, I mean, there's many layers of this. Uh, I think you know, right away we kind of enter it from the point of view of you know we're part of this thing. I don't, you know, like is it even really a thing that you know people question this like the dissident right, online dissident right community? And I mean, I'm 57. I grew up in an era where we didn't have computers, and then suddenly they started coming, and so I spent basically my whole life adapting to digital spaces and lived part of it outside and part of it inside. And there's there's a number 
of of differences that you see. And and one of the things that that in terms of online community that you notice, especially once I got into sort of the Twitter sphere, is that there's a fundamental difference between the, in this sense, the political left and the political right, in that on the political right, especially those who are voicing opinions that, you know, require you to be anonymous or your whole life could be blown up, um, is that for many on the left, they have real world relationships that they built in places like you know, universities, think tanks, you know, working at various organizations and so forth. And what a medium like Twitter does is it allows them to speed run the network building and to sort of put gasoline on all of that, you know, what they do in real life anyways. And we are trying to reverse engineer that beginning with the the digital media and trying to make it real and then wonder why we get nowhere. Yeah, there's there's certainly yeah a, a level of the fact that there you know I'm like you I was I'm not uh, I'm I'm 40 so I'm not I was never in a situation where you know, I com- grew up completely without computers but somewhere around like fifth or sixth grade the internet became a real thing and mm-hmm. so I went from this world where nothing was online to everything was online. Um, so I kind of straddle the fence there. Um, I'm not a complete digital native. I do remember what it was like to not have a cell phone in your pocket. And that happened to me in grad school. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, you know, there, there is this delineation for me, but you know, as you say that the left has real institutional power and is allowed to organize. And this is, this is the most important thing. The right knows it's not allowed to organize. The right is terrified. To organize, you know, basic, you know, just basic groups um, of, uh, you know, just fraternal organizations, these kind of things. Um, these things can be scary. The, you know, the names on rosters and these kind of things are, you know, the left demonizes you. One idiot does something that's not optical and all of a sudden it's everybody and it's your whole life destroyed. It's just, you know, Bill Ayers can literally plant bombs. And end up becoming a college professor and, you know, be celebrated. He can be Barack Obama's mentor, launch his campaign from, you know, whatever. Like, he can do all these things. And so he pays no cost for being a literal terrorist that murdered people. Um, and the right can't even, you know, get together and have a beer without being worried. And, of course, it gets worse depending on certain countries. You know, the UK is really bad. You know, Canada, I know, is not great. The United States is probably the best out of these options, but still we know that the DOJ is running around and looking for excuses to destroy people's lives. And of course the media is as well. And so there's this you know thing where it's been safer for the right to be online. And I, you know, th- there is an Im- important difference between anonymous and pseudonymous posting. Uh, it's a, it's a, yes, uh, it's an important difference. You know, um, it, when you have a pseudonym and you are sticking with that pseudonym, you are building a reputation. You know, people are, are in, in game theoretic terms, they are having multiple sets. They play with you. They are seeing your actions over and over again. They can judge certain parts of you in a way that the like, purely anonymous interactions uh, aren't there. Yes. But, but yeah. it is still a layer of, uh, you know, unreality between you. There's still a significant <laughs> layer of abstraction. Right. And so you, you have these, moments where you the 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 right can do amazing things online you know the meme magic and and and, you know the the way you know you literally have a a presidential campaign in the united states right now that might be determined by the fact that some internet anon account who's been banned off twitter like a thousand times uh went and dug up a video from a facebook uh group about a meeting in springfield ohio so it's not like the you know the online space is doing nothing it it can have very important and significant impact but ultimately it cannot have the institutional impact it cannot have the real world impact it cannot have the the true communal structure uh that really builds those the, those uh pieces of political power because it's terrified to gather into those things in the open because it knows that functionally the left can get away with anything including terrorism and be celebrated and have great lives and the right, you know, like we said, you know, can 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 have their life ruined by sharing a beer with the wrong person in a pub. Yeah, and that that then creates because I mean, really, this is 
what we want to look at is a sense of, you know, what is the difference between internet community and real community? And, and part of it comes down to, to anthropology. So there's a sense of like, okay, so you're inhibited from organizing in real life, or you're trying to reverse engineer this thing, begin online, and then establish real world communities. And you run up into a number of barriers. It seems. The first one, you mentioned it already too, Oren, is this idea that real communities force you to deal with difficult people. And that's one of the skills in a sense that we're losing today. Everything nowadays is about curated relationships. You get these advice articles of like, you know, why aren't you pruning your friend lips? So we, in, in real life now, we're almost treating people like real life is online. Like, you know, you're supposed to basically go through your group chat and prune everybody who isn't really contributing or is annoying. But one of the points of a real community is that you are lumped together with all of these people, some you like, some you don't like, some who are fabulous to be around, and some who are a constant pain in the rear end for various reasons, and you're just simply forced to deal with them. And in many ways, the online, the, the online world doesn't allow you or, or doesn't force you to do that. I mean, you can just hit the block button or the mute button. I mean, you can't just mute somebody in real life as much as you would like to some days. Yeah, and this is the very strange, you know, there's, um, I'm fascinated by the concept of uh, access, you know, like an axis of political organization. And I think that one of the reasons that so many um, attempts at political organization by the left and the center left have failed is because they are trying to do so on uh, an axis that is just not organic. So like, Class mm. is not actually a way you can uh, organize a society. It is not. It you, is like, not. That you, or, or you can, not that you can't organize a society, but not a way you can organize politically. Like there's not, you cannot say, well, everyone in a class has a shared interest, no matter what their background, you know, no matter what their religion, no matter what their community. Mm. That is not what happens. Classes are something that happen inside communities, inside civilizations, not an axis on which you can organize universally. This libertarians have the same problem. Well, everybody who believes in liberty is on our side. Well, that's not true because just look at the libertarian party, right? You have like the Mises caucus, mm -hmm. which are, you know, relatively sane people who uh, understand that you need borders and you probably shouldn't mutilate children, but they are in the same party with people who think, no, absolutely. You have to have open borders and no, you absolutely have to let children get mutilated or you're not really, uh, you know, embracing their freedom. And so this axis of liberty is simply not one on which you can organize, you know, and, and still have a real community. You're just going to spend all, all your time, you know, infighting or, you know, finding reasons to fall apart. And in some ways, the dissident right is like that. It's a bunch of people like libertarians. And I'm sorry, I'm going to say this to the dissident right because <laughs> they know how I feel about libertarian uh, political uh, 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 attempts to organize. But in many ways, the dissident right is like the libertarians in that they have this one axis, which is like the state hates us um, and there's some critical aspect of uh, probably, uh, I guess, the, the, the most uh, reliable thing is that hierarchy is good on the right. Mm -hmm. Like that is the the you know, we believe that uh, actually the goal is not human liberation or human equality. That in fact, you know, these things are, you know, these disparities are natural and normal and they're part of human organization. Uh, but that belief in and of itself is not enough to then actually create an axis of political organization because, okay, we believe that, but we're Christian. Other people believe that and they're pagan. Other people believe that and they are like technologically accelerationist uh, atheists, you know, that we all have this idea that there's something wrong at the heart of the current system and that has something to do with the doctrine of infinite equality but outside of that we don't share real communities in a way that allows us to put our differences behind us and so you know you, you have all these people the red pill community and the christian nationalists and the pagans and the acceleration and they're all fighting for like little bits of territory in a movement that doesn't actually even exist because real movements are actually created by communities that can band together and have a more organic uh, political organization. And so I think that's a huge problem. Well, and this is also one of the reasons why, um, part of what we're talking about is one of the reasons why I do believe that 
you know, going forward, um, that opposition to the regime is going to end up being rooted in the Christian community for partly these dynamics. I mean, it wasn't long ago where in a church community, because you are all bound together in Christ, and sometimes you also had, you know, ethnic ties and, and multi-generational ties that you could often end up in a single congregation having people with very different political views. And that was okay and normal because you were bound together in Christ. Um, and I think people, uh, especially in today's context, you know, as you were saying, when everything is organized along a single ideological access, that they're going to have to struggle with the idea that our opposition is going to come from a group that is probably in some ways going to not be always ideologically aligned, but they are going to have a shared interest against the regime and something other than politics that binds them together. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, I had, um, I had Jeffrey Tucker on recently. Who's, uh, yeah, yes, that was good. The bow tie libertarian, right? Like that. Yeah. You know, he's been known that, you know, for many years. And when we were talking, he said, you know, all the libertarian, ideology all of the the libertarian theory that i had been writing about for years and all of my friends had been writing about and all these important institutes had been you know uh putting together and selling through podcasts and influencers and all these things when tyranny came all of that did nothing no, no, all these people found reasons to to you know come out with excuses the guy running for the president of the you know as part of the libertarian party was himself like a pro vax guy talking about how you know, people, you know, Walter Block is a famous libertarian is talking about how you had to, you had to get these kind of things. And he said, ultimately the people that stood up were the people of religious communities. You know, it's the, mm -hmm. especially the more, you know, ultra Orthodox Jews, Catholics, and evangelicals, right? Like these, these are the groups that actually pushed back that still continued to meet in person that still continued uh, to, to, and, and is, you know, what does this say to us? Well, it says that, you you need something higher than yourself. You need a belief beyond the individual in order to resist that liberty is an insufficient access for political organization. And in fact, to resist the level of tyranny being pushed down, especially right now by the total state, you have to have a belief in something that is more important than your own liberty, your own comfort, you know, the, the state ideology, these kind of things. And, you know, I, I cut this clip from my YouTube channel and a bunch of atheists wandered in and got really, you know, worked up. What about the tyranny of, you know, is Islam or, you know, the, you know, who, uh, whatever, you know, people from the Middle East are controlling everything, whatever. And, and, you know, the point was. You think that liberty means no one has any influence on you. And that is a terrible definition of liberty. That is a definition of liberty Awful. that no one throughout history would have understood the ancients would have rejected liberty is the is the right to be ruled by someone like you who shares your values and shares your culture and has a genuine interest in protecting your way of life Th that ordered liberty to exist in a community like that and to uh, achieve your ends and your you know the 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 liberty to be a ethical a good human being someone pursuing their telos in that community is is actual liberty um and when you so yes like you, maybe it will be a religious community that defines these things in fact it almost certainly will be a religious community that defines these things but if you think that is oppression if you think that is tyranny then you just hate hierarchy you just hate all understanding of structure and order and in that sense you are not my friend and you're not you're not searching for liberty you don't even understand what that look like you don't understand why you're currently enslaved by the ideology that you are and the reason is because you gave up something real, something grounded, something that was that was grounded in truth for a lie about liberation that just puts you under the yoke of a different religious system. Uh, and, and that's that's a real difficulty, even for a lot of people in the online right who don't want to, uh, you know, they don't want to be Christian. They don't think that that's a, a, a significant way forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it I, I, like I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I've written a piece on that where. You know, the people want the feeling of community, like they, they want the milk and cookies feeling and the safe streets and the nice neighborhoods, but they don't want actual real community where, you know, everybody's in your business. 
Um, you basically grow up knowing what your what your career is going to be. You're going to follow in your father's footsteps and take over the family business. You pretty much know the girl that you're going to marry in fifth grade because that's just you, you've been pushed together. You know where you're going to eat lunch on Sunday, every Sunday for the rest of your life. Um, you know where you're going to hang out on every major holiday and all your friend groups are pretty much determined for you. And, and you know, everybody knows your business. There's a clear set of right and wrong. Um, you know, old Mr. So-and-so down at the street and old aunt so-and-so at the end of the thing, they basically dictate what's happening in everybody's lives. And um, everybody's pretty much accountable to them. And if you, do, if you cross one of them, you're on the outs with the community and basically nobody will talk to you. And, you know, those are real communities. And if those real communities are not operative and they're swept away, there's then, you know, you, either you end up with social chaos and society dissolves or some entity will have to step in and that's usually the state. And so if you want to be free from the community, you know, welcome to totalitarianism. That's pretty much your only options. And this is just a really difficult thing to grasp. It's not what I, you know, I did not understand this at all until I, you know, started thinking, you know, a lot about this when I was trying to understand what happened in 2020. And it was really the work of Bertrand de Juvenal above anything else that helped me to, and Joseph de Maestra to help me understand that, um, you know, these are, these are inescapable bonds. And when you try to break them, the only thing you do is have them reassembled, like you said, under the state, right? Like they, there will be people dependent. There will be people, you know, the, the, the world is not made of Randy and super uh, capitalists that can organize, you know, their lives in every moment. Um, and it's not okay to just leave everyone behind who can't do it. And so the state will come in and fill those, those roles. And so there's this, you know, there's this desire um, by a lot of people to say, well, no, that no matter what, like I need to, you know, just never be bound by anything. And it's like, okay, but then, like you said, you're just asking for this state to arise. You're just asking for totalitarianism to come in under a different name. And because you were part of the process, you have difficulty finding any reason to push back against it. Uh, and then all of a sudden you can't figure out why the government is telling you what to say and what to think and, you know, where to send your kids and whether your kids should get chopped up by a doctor. you like, you know, what happened to all this? Like, well, you know, bit by bit, you found it was better for the state to handle these responsibilities. And you thought the state handling, handling the responsibilities of community that you once uh, had imposed on you was freedom. And that was a lie. And now you, here you are not, not sure how you could ever possibly recapture those those responsibilities from a state that has now taken all of that power and, and turned it as you know, on to you as a weapon. Well, and the thing is, is like historically, when you look at it, as communities broke down, there was kind of a golden period where, you know, shortly after World War II, there was this kind of, you know, you had this sort of um, break in history. You know, the war ended, everything's good again. And, um, people embraced a kind of new liberty, libertarianism, and they threw off sort of all of these old bonds of community. They got into television, they got into radio, all the sort of mass culture stuff, the car and all the rest of it. And, but these folks that first embraced this kind of new liberty, um, they still knew what it was like to live in an ordered community. And so they self-ordered themselves and didn't kind of drive off a cliff. But then you move forward three generations and nobody remembers what it likes to live, what it's like to live in a real community. And now people can't fathom the idea of, well, what is real community? So the only thing that they know is, is, you know, pseudo online communities or state control. And they can't really fathom the idea that, you know what, society used to be held together in the village. And it was old Aunt Maud down the street and the, the, you know, the parish priest or whatever, they basically ran things and that was good. And, you know, in order to create the kind of commercial society that we have now, all of this had to be swept away. And in, in order to build the kind of political system that we have today, all of this had to be swept away almost intentionally. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said that high civilizations, you know, they're, they're never killed. They always commit suicide by forgetting <laughs> um, obvious things. And it's it's so true that, 
you know, when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of years of hard fought knowledge, hard fought realizations, uh, brought together under tradition, people forget where those lessons came from. Oh, we're just, we're just, you know, doing this marriage thing because some old book told us to, Oh, we're just, you know, uh, perpetuating this belief because we've done it in schools forever. And you know, there's of course some truth to that. Like there's, you know, how long can you perpetuate something without having gone through the hardship? That's, that's the real, that's the real challenge of social technology when it comes to ritual and tradition. But over time, usually there's, you know, some level of, of course correction, right? Like things come apart and you, you, you have to start pushing things back together. But we got in this scenario where we were just removing Jenga blocks from the base of the tower as quickly as possible because we're like, well, these idiots just keep leaving these, you know, blocks at the bottom of the tower when the tower could be taller. And, you know, why wouldn't you want the tower to be taller? The, the tower taller means, you know, longer lifespans and, you know, more vacations and, you know, bigger why, 401k. Why, you're right. Yeah. Why, why would you, you know, why would you just leave these stupid blocks at the bottom of the tower when you can stack them on top and then, you know, you can go on like seven cruises after you retire. Um, and, and slowly as the tower starts tilting to one side, we go, Whoa, hold on. And, and, and this is so much of my generation's problem. And, and it, it you know, the, I, cause I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the line between Gen X and millennial. I'm like four years into millennial, but you know, I, I grew up in a world that was still, heavily defined by kind of the gen x mindset and the hardest problem for a lot of the millennials is like they lived watching the boomers have this lifestyle and they assume mm. that lifestyle was theirs right like that lifestyle yeah. is just the way that america will be forever and they yell at boomers for being like well you know you know, uh, you should just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and i got a job in in you know in college and paid for college by you know flipping burgers and you should be able to do that too and you know why didn't you just buy a house for thirty thousand dollars and then sell it for five hundred thousand dollars you know why, why not just be smart like me and those are all like fair <laughs> those are all fair points but at the same time they have the same uh assumptions that the boomers did that like life would always get better that life would always improve that that it was the the graph goes up and the right forever and so they're not angry at at you know the baby boom generation for having a bad conception of society they're jealous that they don't get to live the way the boomy the baby boomers live they they're angry that they don't get to unspool society while enjoying all the benefits of of what was left of the social fabric and that's a really good point are that, that that yeah they're in many ways they're not many are not looking to go back to the world of the late 1800s or earlier they're looking to go back and say like, Hey, we want the, we want what the baby boom had. We right. want to, you know, those are the images that, that drive us. Yeah. I'm in many ways, similar to you. I'm like three years, four years into the, into gen X. So I, I lived in a world basically defined by baby boomers. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, the thing is though too, like, I think a lot of people don't quite grasp that, that many of these, features of the online world and in a sense building world building community the unreality of it are very similar to many of the things that people um fight against the hardest like we talk about you know um you know the, the whole transgenderism thing and people don't grasp that the sort of disembodied mind that is part of what makes social media and the internet, you know, possible that that conception of the self that my real self is my disembodied mind is also the same idea that is behind something like transgenderism it says, like, if I can surgically alter my body and get the right mix of hormones in there, I can actually make reality what I want it to be. And so in many ways, the right is falling into the same trap as the transgender movement in a sense that we conceive of it in our mind and that's who we believe that we are. And now we believe that we can instantiate it in reality and it doesn't quite work that way. 
Yeah, it, it's very difficult. There's, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's become a little cliche in uh, in right wing circles at this point to reference C.S. Lewis's uh, abolition of man. But he's really right. And so I'm going to do it again because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to beat this point to death until people get it. <laughs> um, you know, he, he talks about how the social engineering that was already occurring at his time, you know, and he's writing this in the mm -hmm. 1940s, was re was creating a radical break between kind of uh, the educated man and real humanity, like or organic humanity. And that he was very worried that after several generations of social engineering, that which was human would be completely filtered out of mankind. Uh and, you know, all these basic organic impulses would be gone. And he said at that point, that's the abolition of man, because there's no living memory of what man should have been. You know, the the all of the, the ghost of what uh, animated mankind is gone. And what you have in its place is this entirely artificial engineered creature. And in a lot of ways, the the, the, the dissonant right is that creature. Right. It's this it's this accumulation of people who are at the end of this process of social engineering or probably not the end, but you know, on, on, on the back half of it. And they're looking at it and saying, uh, there's little to nothing left of what made people human, what made things good. I know I want a good life. I know I want a life ordered towards the good, but I don't even know what that looks like. I've never even seen it. You know, the only thing I've seen is maybe it being mocked on TV, you know, that, that, that's, that's the extent to which I understand it. And so what do we need to go back? Do we need, you know, women in sundresses walking through wheat fields? Do we need guys who don't eat, you know, seed oils? Do we need, uh, you know, what will, uh, you know, do we need to return to paganism? You know, what do we need that will, that will re, you know, uh, reinstantiate this kind of like organic order once again? And the answer is nobody's sure and nobody knows what that looks like. And it's harder and harder to build any semblance of that because as we already discussed, so much of this is done online where you can't actually build the organic community where you, you don't have those friction points. You're not stuck with somebody. You don't have to figure out how to actually care about an entire people uh, because, you know, everything is curated. Everything is, is selective. Um, and so, you know, we do see some, communities gathering you know the guys over at new founding have ridge runner mm -hmm. and they're putting that together uh you know there there are communities uh that might be forming that might turn into real organic you know creations of of uh but but that's going to take generations for that to happen and a lot of people are trying to like bumps yeah and, and a lot of people want it to happen like tomorrow and that's just yeah. not going to happen you're not going to live in this world but if you work really hard your kids might, but that's, mm. that's not a lesson that sell that. That's not something that you can sell for clicks on Twitter. So it's a, it's a harder thing. Well, and this is, you know, this gets into some of the other points that I was hoping to make is, is, um, cause I grew up in, in a, a second generation immigrant community, Dutch reformed. And so we have a real community. I know what it's like to have to get along with people that I don't like, cause you have to do it all the time. And, you know, part of my thing is how do I wake my people up to what's going on? That's a very different question than, than others. But I do get this thing because what happens is when community breaks down, um, and I've talked about this as one of the things that Alul deals with, is once the community is broken down, then the, the propagandist and the technologist, the economist, is they take all of these things that were organic, they, they objectify them, rationalize them and then try to reassemble them into um, high functioning systems. You know, mm -hmm. the example I use is, you know, you, you sort of take apart the, you know, the stable master and the, you know, the guys from McKinsey come in and examine the stable, break it all down, and then they can franchise the whole thing, what used to be embedded knowledge. And on the other side, you know, real community gets broken down and then people try to reassemble their life as if it were a collection of brands. And like you were saying, sort of the neo-trad life. So what do I need to do to be, be traditional? Well, I look at some of these old photographs. Well, I wear a dress like this. I'm on a farm that looks like this. And you piece together all the pieces. And then you post it on social media. And you think you're, you're living a traditional life in a traditional community. But that's not really how it works. You basically, in some ways, you've got almost like a transgender community. 
you've just stitched it together from all the parts. It's a Frankenstein community, but it's not a real community yet. And I say to people too, if you say, well, I'm going to go over here and put down roots. I said, well, yeah, that might be good, but you won't have roots. Your great grandchildren will have roots if they stay there. And I think that you just mentioned that like, and, and this is, I think a thing that our people don't understand. And in many ways, why our people are still in a lot of ways stuck in a kind of progressive mindset. Because this is one of the things that Alul says in terms of propaganda, that the kind of messaging that you need to build communities runs contrary to the core message of, you know, better, faster, bigger, higher, more, line go up. Um, and and that's really, I think, one of the conflicts that we have. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess as a, you know, a student of neo-reaction, I have to uh, bring this into the postmodern frame. Uh, Gilles Deleuze uh, describes the same process uh, that Alul is is oh, yeah. describing there. He calls it deterritorialization and re-territorialization. You have okay. these codes, you have these processes, you have these identities that are they're they're coded for a particular community, a particular organic way of life. And you know he 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 calls it capital. The force that comes in is is first the first the the warlord, but eventually capital, and it comes in and it. It uh, strips out, you know, all of these things and reorganizes them. It re-territorializes them, uh, particularly with capital into the marketplace. And so now all these things like who am I going to marry or, you know, uh, th this kind of stuff that used to be tied to something that was sacred, that was familial, that was organic. Now that goes on to like job, you know, dating sites and these kind of things. Yeah. What, what am I going to be when I grow up? Well, that used to be something determined by my father and my father's father and my father's father and my father's father. Now it's something that I find out when I plug my resume into Indeed, right? Like these are the, the these are the the systems that we've kind of re-territorialized everything into, um, and so it's it's very difficult because our problem is not just one of outlook, which you're you're right to point to, but and this is what I tried to hit on my book that in the total state, and I'm I'm hoping to expand on my next book, is we are we are. Um, we are facing a problem of systems, which I know you know mm -hmm. from Alul, but you know, we, sure. what we are looking to do now is something that um, fights against the logic of massification. Um, and the mm -hmm. problem is that massification has had a um, like at least a 500 year winning streak. Right. And, and so it, it, the, the advantages of it are undeniable. You can't, you mm -hmm. know, when people point to liberalism and they say, oh, well, you know, you know, there, there's all these things you wouldn't have without it. It's like, well, there's there's a certain level of truth to that. Right. But the but there were trade offs. These weren't solutions. These were trade offs. And they the, each one of the things you treasure now cost us something. But mm -hmm. we've rewritten our history to tell us that all the things we lost weren't really that big of a deal. And all the things we gained were the only things that mattered. And so you have this moment where, yes, we want to go back to certain things or we want to understand different ways to do things, but that's going to be a sacrifice. Like we're going to lose something. And, and this is the real problem. Like, even if you're willing, even if you can talk everyone in these sacrifices, the other people in the globe are not like the, the arms race for state centralization and power continues. Even if you opt out of it, you're like, well, we're not going to build tanks. Well, that's cool. The other guy's still building the tank tanks. problem. Right. Yeah, the yeah, tank and, problem. And, and, right. And so, and so this yeah. this is a real struggle. Like, yeah, the 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 dissident right, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, they could create these organic communities. They could break down into these, and they could, you know, um, uh, return to a certain level of organic social construction. But they, if they do the things necessary to maintain that kind of um, that kind of uh, interaction, they will be giving up powers that are critical to winning an arms race inside. And, and this is why Bertrand de Juvenal points to like, while there are huge advantages and critical things we lost in moving out of these feudal societies or these, you know, these, these um, you know, societies of antiquity, we can't go back. Like, even if we wanted to go back, so, you know, Fustel Collange says the same thing in the ancient city. He talks about, you know, the deep bonds of the Greeks and the Romans and how central religion was and how religion defined everything in the way that we think that science does today. It's the, you know, it is the substrate from which like all of your interactions actually arise. But he's like, at the end of that book, it's just like, and we can never return to this moment because we can never recapture what it means to, to really uh, have, you know, this be the water in which we swim. 
Uh, and that's that's something that um, we're not thinking enough about as we do this. And I don't know. I don't have a great answer to it yet, but I'm, I'm trying my best. Well, <laughs> the, you, you, you probably I think you would really enjoy Alul's um, political illusion because he he talks about this very problem there. He says, we think that we have political choices, but he says that's just an illusion. He says we don't, because as you were saying, if you want to go back to like real communities, um, China isn't. Right. You know, the Russians aren't these types of yeah. things. Um, and and so, yeah, you can have, you know, you could break a, the United States up into, you know, 500 little principalities and we all go, go back to a traditional life. But and maybe the oceans protect us. But, you know, chances are somebody's going to figure out how to conquer us because they're still, do, you know, they're still using all of the basic techniques and technologies that built the modern society. Um, so it, it's it, it's it's a real dilemma. But part of the this is one of the things I think part of where we are is understanding that it's a dilemma. And, and before you can even begin to do anything about it, you have to kind of understand where you are and in a sense, what one well, of what's wrong. But, um, you know, and then before you can meaningfully ask the question of is there something that we can do about it? Is there a middle ground where we accept the trade offs, but we don't continue to um, push to the maximum the kind of unreason of the things that we're doing now and recognizing these are not going to actually quote unquote solve the problems, but that we can find a way to um, accept me. I don't know. It, it's, and this is kind of the, the the challenge that you have is that there's really no good answers. Um, and, and you can recognize what you lost. You can see that the threat from outside, if you make changes, but at the same time, we can't continue the way we're going. Um, and that's really, you know, sort of the path that we're on. Yeah, and that's the real question. And, you know, as you point out, the the current the current paradigm is unsustainable, and so it won't sustain. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, and so it can mm. it can go on for for a good while, especially when you're talking about uh, you know these first world countries that were the imperial core, and they have a large amount of you know you 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 can exist in a you know quasi second uh, world existence for a decent amount of time in the United States or Canada or some of these other other nations without watching the whole thing crash down um you know uh, something that a lot of people are thinking about and exploring is well what about you know artificial intelligence what about you know technology can technology more or less uh replicate the power that the managerial elite the the uh, impact the managerial elite currently wield but do it without the like need to propagandize and align a lot of biomass, right? Like, can you make smaller communities that still get the, the, the level of production efficiency, uh, you know, these kind of things can, can, can technology outrun this problem? Right. Um, no. I'm skeptical <laughs> of that. Um, me too, yeah, but <laughs> very skeptical of that, but, but I will yeah. say this, I, I do think there is a, you know, there we're in a weird moment. People don't recognize how much of the current global order is held together with like, chicken wire, you know, and a little bit of duct tape. Um, yeah. North Carolina will tell you that right now. Well, it, I mean, and as somebody who, you know, two years ago had a hurricane literally destroy everything, you know, we had no power for three weeks. We couldn't get in and out. Everything was flooded. You know, like we, you know, we had it pretty bad. We were, we were right up there. We, we had bodies washing into to people's yards and stuff, you know? So, so, you know, uh, praying for those guys. And I, I, I unfortunately know what that is like. Um, you know, they have the, the, the veil is very thin, uh, that you, that you mm. keep on society. But I, but by that, I mean is, you know, that order is extended and projected into all of these areas into Africa and, you know, parts of, of, uh, undeveloped Europe and, and Asia by the fact that like a lot of first world countries are, are maintaining that infrastructure for populations that otherwise just could not do it. And so Eventually, you know, if you have a breakdown of a of a global order, if you have the inability of these nations to project that technological and maintain that technological advancement, uh, sorry, but like those countries aren't going to keep doing it. And at that point, you do get this moment where, you know, things can scale back down, you know, when you don't have this, you know, you you OK, we can't reliably work on, you know, just in time delivery across the entire globe. It just doesn't work like logistically. We cannot continue that. At some point, if you do that, then smaller forms, you know, more regional forms of political organization do become real. Like they, they do yes. reemerge as options. 
And in that moment, you have, you know, the, these, the, you know, I, I uh, you know, it, it's, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to mortgage the house on this, but I do think that there is a future in which the city state returns where sm- yes. much smaller forms of political organization return, but they maintain a level of sophistication inside those small units. Mm-hmm. So they, they, you know, they figure out how to take, um, you know, that supply chain and scale it down. They figure out how to localize enough of that production uh, and cycle and these kind of things to maintain a certain level of quality of living and technological advancement, but only for, you know, so many hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and That's I right. think that that is a, that is a, a, a real possibility. And in that moment, then you can become more selective about what your populations are. Right. And this is what you see in Curtis mm. Yarvin's patchwork or what you see in Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, A Thousand Lichtensteins, right? Like, basically, the states as they were originally intended to be, like self-governing entities, uh, in you know, that are uh, able, able to, you know, you know, well, we're super Christian, we're super Muslim, we're going to continue down this insane road of uh, progressive humanism, you know, like, th- those things can fracture apart again in a way that, they, and, and then thereby create cohesive communities because, you actually have a bunch of people with the same moral vision, you know, in the same place. And that, that accelerates your cultural development. Yes. And I, I think I, I agree that it, it's, there is probably a point where the world is going to retrench and that the city state or the small, small regions at least make, make a lot more sense in that regard from a management perspective. I mean, we'll have to see, um, I think maybe just to to kind of come back to a couple of other issues that were sort of in the back of my mind. One of these in terms of, um, you know, digital online space that we saw is the, you know, during COVID, when many churches did acquiesce, one of the things that 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 struck me was the this this understanding that, or it really hit home to me you know, because we'd always like Sunday morning, you know, oh, you want to sleep in, um, you know, but you drag yourself off to church. And then the first couple months of COVID when everything was shut down and, oh, you know, my, I have a fairly large church and, um, or ours is a fairly large church and they're technologically savvy. So they, you know, online services became a thing almost immediately. And for about a month, it was nice. Oh, I get to sleep in, I can go to church in my pajamas and these types of things. And then all of a sudden it hit me like, this isn't church. Like, we, you know, I, and I said to my wife, I said, the first moment that those doors are open, we are back in church and we are going to be one of the the leaders there every Sunday saying people like, you have to be in this physical space with other believers because being at home in your living room is not Christian worship. And that was, I think, one of these things that cemented a lot of things that I had read elsewhere. And it's like, you know, you need sometimes a key that unlocks it all. And that was sort of the moment that was like, oh, I kind of get what everybody has been saying that community is embodied. I see what they mean now. Yeah, no, there's a very real uh, pressure point there where you have the question of how long can you lock people into their homes? Like how long can you have them simulate relationships on Skype or zoom or, you know, uh, Facebook or these kind of things. How long can you put people in front of Netflix and that will kind of fill their desire for personal interaction. And the answer is a lot, far too much, right. For a, for a large amount of people that, that will actually drive them, you know, out. And then that's why several businesses, several uh, consumer models were just killed by COVID, right? Just completely oh, destroyed. Yeah. Malls. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Things that were already on the way out, but, uh, but uh, only accelerated their demise, uh, you know, just in-person retail, right? Like these things are becoming more and more uh, something that is just being removed, especially with, you know, the, the amount of shoplifting and things that, you know, the crime that uh, in, in real life retail has to deal with, like these things are just going away. And that's why, as we said, the religion is one of the few things that can actually create uh, any kind of pushback to this. It's the only, you know, it's one of the few things that will create resistance because if you don't have that deep desire to worship God, if you don't have that deep innate need to go and be with the body of Christ and, you know, and, and, and you know that that moment in which you are, like you said, the community is embodied and you were there in worship, 
If you don't know from experience that that's different and that it's necessary, then online church is probably fine, right? Like you watch, you know, football online and, you know, you watch it like you you can just do all the things that you used to do in person online. You know, all your friends. You know, I, I grew up in an era where a lot of people obviously are big on online gaming. Um, mm-hmm. But I still have a lot of friends that we get together every week to play board games. It's not that we yes. couldn't play. the All of these games are available online at this point. But that's not yeah. the point. The point is not just to go through the motion of playing the game. But if you if you have not lived in that world, especially if you're a kid who was raised without any of those those notions of community, then it's incredibly difficult to understand why it's worth the effort. Well, and this is one of the things I think, too, that that Spengler gets into is that to a community is a spiritual bond. And and one of the things he talks about, even more so than like genetic ties and language, is that you have to be a people that are, in a sense, crammed together in a particular space. And it's it's being together in a space that really makes community what it is, you know. So you eat together, you know. You smell each other. You, um, you know, you can touch. I mean, you can't hug somebody online. Um, you can't shed a tear for them. You you lose all the body language. There is just a whole range of human experiences that just are not available to you when you're not together. And um, there's something about, like you say, just gaming with people, you know, a group of people together, you know, playing a set of games that, that you bond together. Um, we have a, a, a monthly Euchre tournament that we do. Um, you know, we vary, you know, usually five tables, right? So you're talking like 20 people and it, you know, the, and the group that attends is probably about 40 people all together. But, you know, even if you're not talking about anything else, at least you're playing cards, but you're doing that together and your kids are growing up together and all these other things that are happening and you're bonded in the real thing. And you just simply can't do that over zoom. And in some ways, I think, um, again, there are certain benefits from our culture in terms of, you know, um, breaking people away from those real life relationships. Um, but at the same time, the cost is that, you know, community just kind of disappears. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that is just a challenge that is going to have to be overcome, but first it has to be realized. And that's That's why, you know, I, that's why I push back against Benjamin who otherwise I think has a lot of great insights, but he, you know, it, it, it was, again, it's not that you can't meet people online. It's not that you can't become friends with people online, but it's understanding that you have to take that, you know, that acquaintance offline and into the real world before it becomes anything approaching actual community. And so we can't lie to ourselves about this idea that like, you know, we're doing something online again, Anon's changing the course of presidential campaigns right now. So I'm not decrying the efforts of people online. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. they can't have significant impacts, but long-term we have to find a way to move these things into the real world. And that's why places like new founding, that's why places like the old glory club, that's why groups like exit. These are groups that are focused on, we get together, we make the sacrifice to be in the same space, to work together. And anytime you're in these rooms, you can feel the energy. You know, the first time I went to one of these conferences, you can feel the energy because everyone is there because they are willing to make significant sacrifices. You know, these Mm. events are costly. You have to travel, you need to prevent present yourself in a certain way. You know, there's, it's not just like anyone can drop a message on a Twitter thread. You know, this is a very different form of interaction. And so it's a lot of guys with similar goals who are, you know, trusting each other and putting themselves in proximity to each other. And so many of the disagreements that you think would be a problem fall away the minute you're in real they life. Do. And, yeah. and, but, but, but again, you don't know until you make that, you, you take that step out of the digital and into the real. Well, or the other thing around this guy that you think is like totally fabulous online, when you get him into a room together, turns out to be a real jerk. Yeah. Right? And you're just like, I didn't realize this guy is such a big jerk. Like, and I've idolized him for years, you know, and like, these are the kind of things that happen in real life relationships. I think maybe like, just because we're getting close to to time, but one of the, I mean, the last thoughts that I thought I would leave with, with our people in many ways too, is just to understand the difference in a sense with organic relationships and online relationships One of the things that happens with propaganda when community is broken down, the the, the propagandist wants this because once you're broken down into a mass society and you're isolated and you're, in a sense, you're online and is that 
you're you're much that's in a sense the way they want you. And in this sense, they want you reading the newspaper, listening to the TV racing, because then your your interaction is directly with the propagandist. So even though you feel like you're part of a radio community, like this is like people would talk about this with Rush, that I'm part of the radio community, but that relationship isn't really horizontal, it's vertical. And it's vertical through the propagandist. And in this sense, when we're having online relations, we talk about this all the time, how the algorithm shapes the timeline and all these things. We have to realize that if you're trying to build community, you're trying to build community in an environment of propaganda where the relationships are not really horizontal, but they're mediated vertically through the algorithm, that somebody is manipulating and controlling your relationship. In a sense, just the fact that you're on a, a, a medium like Twitter means that you're being propagandized. And it's that we have to get off of these platforms, as you're saying, too, to reinstantiate like real community before in that sense, we can free ourselves from all of the problems that sort of the mass culture, online culture is really creating for us. Yeah. The, the, uh, the catchphrase for this now is parasocial, right? They're parasocial relationships. Yeah. It's a good word. And so, uh, you know, I, I do this, you know, when we're talking, <laughs> I'll be like, look guys, um, you know, I, I love you. I have a great audience. You're amazing, but I don't know you, right? Like you're just an audience. Like, uh, you know, we're not your friends. Like we're glad you're yeah. listening and we're hope we're doing something for you, but like get out, make friends, do something. Right. And yeah. so when we go, go uh -huh. yes. Yeah. And, and when we go to like, when we have the, you know, when the OGC events are happening, the old glory club events are happening. Yes. A number of the speakers are content creators because that's kind of what draws people in. They know that, you know, this speaker is the guy they've been watching for years and they get to see them that blah, blah, blah. But the thing that they always do, which I really respect, is they take a lot of time to put non-content creators into speaking roles. You know, oh, cool. they, you've got you've got a couple of guys who are who are big names, but then they take guys who are you know experts in law and experts in bureaucracy and experts in uh, you know education and all these things who don't have you know a platform but have knowledge that is critical. And they make sure to spread that out. And so, you know, when you first walk into that environment, everyone's crowded around a few influencers, a few personalities, because that's who they know. But by the end of the event, there's not a lot of people talking to those people anymore. And that's perfect. That's exactly the way it should be. Because once they're there, they start talking to these other people and they find out, oh, well, that guy actually just lives an hour away from me. And he and he's knows a lot. Yeah. And, and he knows a lot about, you know, he was in the military. He knows a lot about preparedness. Hey, that guy knows a lot about uh, incorporation. We've been thinking about trying to build a community mm. here. We want to figure out how that works. You know, like they realize that there is a room full of experts, you know, highly capable people who are just as, if not more important to getting things done than the guys who like have podcasts. And so that is also very helpful because it shifts us out of this parasocial mindset and saying, oh, well, we care about, you know, this guy because I'm a Rush Limbaugh fan or whatever. And instead you're in the scenario where, yeah, I came to listen to Rush Limbaugh, but also, you know, these seven guys that I met, I'm going to form a chapter with them because they live in my area. And now we're doing real life things. And now I'm, you know, I'm focused on learning from these guys, you know, not so much, you know, only the people who have the, you know, so the media figures matter. They have the kind of the, the toe in the real world, you know, that is fake. Uh, that they can draw people in, but, but they're only the top of the funnel. And, and, and mm -hmm. once you get into those scenarios, then you can make bonds with, with people who are, you know, doing real things, have real skills. Uh, and you're no longer just locked into this pattern of the propagandist and the audience. That's right. Well, this has been really, really good, Orn, and we could probably keep going and talking. But, you know, just in case there's that odd person that doesn't know how to find you, who, like, listens to my audience but doesn't listen to you, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, I'm over on, uh, of course, Blaze TV, uh, uh, YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, uh, Twitter, Gab. Everything is Orin McIntyre or the Orin McIntyre show, so. Well, again, thank you. This is this is a really good conversation. It went completely different in many ways than I thought it was going to, which was fabulous. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on and um, all the best with um, with what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey.